Hi, my name is Chris Dixon. I'm the co-founder of Hunch and an early stage investor. Um, this is uh, Startup Sherpa, and uh, it's a show by entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurs. We hope you'll uh, learn something useful. Uh, today we have Perry Chan, who's the co-founder of Kickstarter. Um, thanks for being here, Perry. Thank you, Chris. Um, can you tell us what Kickstarter is? Sure. Um, Kickstarter is a platform for funding creative projects, and um, it's kind of a it's our take on a very old idea. Mm -hmm. You know, back in Mozart's day, artists like Mozart and Beethoven, they would fund premieres of concerts and first editions of their work by going to the audience and getting patrons to give monies. And until they had a sufficient amount, they wouldn't premiere the show, they wouldn't start the printing press. Mm -hmm. And uh, those early supporters would get, you know, copies of those first editions, early access to those mm -hmm. shows, and they'd get also the feeling of, of being patrons. And so we've tried to replicate a lot of the spirit of that uh, hmm. in Kickstarter today. And that's the way the model works, is that until you hit a certain threshold um, of funding, so you sort of set a funding threshold, and when you hit that threshold, then the project gets funded. But until then, it doesn't, is that right? You basically, like, you'll, you'll set a duration, so 30 hmm. days, and, and you'll continue to fund throughout the duration, even if you raised all your money on day one. But essentially, you need to raise the funds that, that the goal that you set. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and so, and the advantage of that for the the project creators is, is what? I mean, as opposed to, let's say, you know, other sources of funding that they might seek. Um, well, you know, it's, it's you're going direct to the audience, right? I mean, everybody has an audience, whether it's just your friends or if you're lucky enough to have fans or you're part of, you know, various online or offline communities. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of cutting out the middlemen if mm -hmm. you're in an industry like music or film or um, publishing that has middlemen. Mm -hmm. um, they might be really hard to access. They might have really onerous terms. Uh, yeah. to work with and so you're, you're able to go directly to the audience and find a way to exchange value with them to get uh, a project made. So let's take music as an example like historically people would like you'd start a band you'd go perform you'd hopefully sign with the label right. you'd sign maybe a multi-year deal. If you're unbelievably lucky. If, yeah the, the very the outlying right. cases this is like the super outlying lucky cases um, then you go and you sort of see if people like it and sell albums um, and so you've sort of gotten sort of you know, taking that, that middleman out of the equation, right. um, which I guess is, number one is, is sort of you get less onerous terms for the for the You artists. actually own your music. You, so they actually own the music, okay, right. that's important. Um, uh, so one is you get less onerous terms, and I think two is also, isn't it sort of interesting that you can kind of uh, test demand for the music very early? In other words, you know, instead of having this process of going creating it and marketing it, you actually see sort of up front. Uh, I mean, it's really interesting, you know, like we definitely live in a culture where people have, um, they, they create things and then they bring them to market and mm -hmm. then at that point they find out what the audience thinks. Um, you know, I wouldn't think that artists that really want to create something wouldn't make the album if they didn't get funding. They would, yeah. They'd would. they really find a way to try to piece it together. They they may not be able to make what they yeah. wanted to do, but they'll, they'll find a way to create their vision. Um, but by attaching the audience early, you know, you have these people who feel connected to your project very, very early on. Mm -hmm. um, and it really brings them closer to you and your work. And, it, and you know, then they're going to help you spread the word in a very different way than, than a consumer who picks up an album off the shelf would. Yeah. So how did you um, come up with the idea for Kickstarter, and what like how did you get how did you start the company? And you know, uh, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, who think about uh, you know starting a company think you have to go work at, you know, Google for five years right. and do all sorts of other. I don't. That's not your background, right? And no, no. I, I um, you know, I've I've kind of jack of all trades, master of none. You know, I. I uh, when I graduated school, I was living in New Orleans, and I, I came back to New York where I was born and raised, and I you know, did various things. I worked a little bit in the business world. A little, I had an art gallery with some friends. I moved back to New Orleans and focused on working on music, um, taught a little preschool, worked in restaurants. So, and I was really around the creative community a lot, and I had a little bit of a business background from starting a gallery. Uh, and when I had the early idea for Kickstarter, which was a million years ago, um, I wouldn't even have known. It was, where it was to begin. like literally ten years ago, right? It you was said. like in 2002, yeah. yeah, when I was in New Orleans, and mm -hmm. I, and uh, wanted to put together a concert, um, and could have really used a system like this where I could have kind of queried the audience and them help me decide whether whether I should go ahead and, and do the show and help um, bring it to life and be a part of the process from the beginning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't even start working on it for for years and years just because a I didn't necessarily know where to begin. You know, I wasn't coming from working on the web, uh, and then b at the time I really you know, probably couldn't have been any less interested in, in dedicating my life, which is clearly what it takes to, yeah. to do something like this. Yeah, and also I think probably a lot of the things, the, the, the infrastructure wasn't in place 
because in O2 you probably had to to do to start something like Kickstarter you had to be you know have a team of engineers and like I didn't set up a payment concept. system and like yeah but, I mean I think I mean, aren't you guys like built on I mean you know aren't you like built on like a whole bunch of like Amazon yeah, I mean, payments and all this yeah. and it's Rails and you know I think the bigger things were I, mean, I think that's one of the interesting things here is that you can be kind of like a creative type like you and create a really interesting um, you know internet startup these days because there's all this infrastructure already in place. Or right? in anything in technology, right? Yeah. Like now people can create films who aren't filmmakers. Now people yeah. can make albums that aren't, you know, that aren't professional musicians. And that, you know? that trickles down to the to the to the projects on Kickstarter, right? You can create like a great, you know, I don't know, like girl talk <coughs> like mix up thing or whatever just on your like iPad these days, right? I mean isn't the cost of production like dropped radically for all of these things? Yeah, I mean it's the user generated movement, right? Like exactly. Cost of production and cost of education, right? Like we can go online and for free if we dedicate our time, we can learn how to do things that in the past we might have had to go take classes or mm -hmm. go to school for. And so you can learn how to mm -hmm. to become a decent filmmaker or a musician, you know, by for, for very little money. Mm -hmm.